Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, this is the next chapter in the Organizational Psychology module for Cambridge A2 Psychology. Um, this is going to be about leadership and management, right? I love to start my classes with this question. Do you think leaders are born or made? What do you think? Think about it for yourself for a moment. Right? Now, um, before we go any further, I have to always, or rather, uh, one of the suggestions I came up for my students in class was to ask them to read through past year question papers, keep some of those questions in mind, and pick up points during the lecture to answer, to answer those questions. So, here are two questions that I got from a past year paper, and you can keep this in mind as we go through the syllabus. Now, first question is, describe what psychologists have discovered about traditional and modern theories of leadership. So what are the keywords here? First of all, describe. What does describe mean? Describe means to give details, to explain the main features of, and so on. Right. So give a lot of details. And what psychologists have discovered about traditional and modern theories of leadership. Right. So those are the keywords, traditional and modern. Next question is evaluate what psychologists have discovered about traditional and modern theories of leadership, including a discussion of nature versus nurture. Now the evaluate part here, the word evaluate is a keyword that suggests to us that we need to discuss the importance of, judge the overall worth, make an attempt to weigh up your opinions. Okay, So keep these two questions in mind, we're going to be focusing on traditional and modern theories of leadership. What points can you pick up in the lecture? Now, there are five chapters, uh, we've covered the first one which is motivation to work. The next one which we're covering right now is leadership and management. Right? What is leadership and management? Okay, so we're going to be talking first and foremost, um, it's divided into three parts. The first part, part A, is talking about traditional and modern theories, right? Let's look at this quote by Thomas Carlyle. The history of the world is but the biography of great men. Do you agree? Do you disagree? What do you think? Oftentimes when we think of a great leader, think about a great leader in your life that you know of. Are they usually men or women? Hmm. Now, stereotypically, it usually appears, that even if you search on Google, you'll find a lot of great leaders tend to be men. I'm not saying that, are, that, I'm not saying that there are no female great, leader, great female leaders. There are. But it seems to in, be more inclined towards men, right? And that is the basis for some of the universalist theories, right? The universalist theories um, suggest that leadership is due to personal qualities and characteristics, right? It's essentially something that you are born with. It's not something that you can become, right? And, and there are similarities that are shared across great leaders, right? Woods in 1913 came up with the great man theory, right? Um, if I'm not mistaken, this has been changed to the great person theory so that it's more gender inclusive. But when he first proposed it, it was the great man theory, which suggested that history is shaped by great men. Not so much for women, unfortunately, right? Leaders, according to this theory, are born and not made, right? Um, you also have characteristics of what is known as a transformational leader, right? A transformational leader is someone who has a lot of charisma. Charisma basically means they're able to, when they speak, they can capture your attention. Right? I had a lecturer like that in my university. His name was Dr. Go, another lecturer named Miss Winnie. They used to give us three-hour lectures, right, in university for psychology. For three hours, they managed to hold our attention, right? And that was incredible. Not many lecturers can do that. Most students just fall asleep in class, right? But I had two incredible lecturers who managed to hold our attention for that length of time. Uh, they're very good at inspiring people, excellent public speaking skills, and a lot of confidence. These are transformational leaders, right? They're visionaries. They're unconventional. They don't just follow the crowd. They're, they're different. Right? You, when, when you hear them speak, they're just different, right? It's incredible. Um, can you name a great leader? Okay, think of the first great leader that comes to mind. My favorite leader of all time is uh, Mahatma Gandhi. I really admire Mahatma Gandhi's principles, um, the way he conducted himself, the, the things that he believed in, right? He believed in peace and non-violence under all circumstances, right? He never believed in fighting. It's always about being peaceful and, you know, he helped India gain its independence. Captain America, a uh, fictional great leader, right? And honestly, if you watch the movies, you can see how he pulls the team together, right? He's the cement that holds the team together with everybody looks to him, you know, even the name Captain, right? 
captain commands that, that attention that everybody looks towards him as the leader. What are we going to do next? He has to decide, right? Uh, what about a female leader? One of the great female leaders that I know of is Aung, Aung, Aung San Suu Kyi, right? She is a female leader in uh, Burma or Myanmar. Rather, unfortunately, uh, Myanmar has just gone through a military coup at the time of recording. And it's very sad to say that the military has overthrown her and put her in prison. It's very unfortunate because, you know, with her, Myanmar was hopefully going to become a more democratic country. Uh, and it happens, you know, sometimes people are afraid of their leaders and they try to overthrow them. Now, let's look at behavioral theories, right? Behavioral theories about leadership, okay? This is still under the traditional and modern theories chapter. Behavioral theories uh, focus on the behavior of leaders, right? Not so much their personal qualities, right? So earlier on, it was more about how they're born leaders. Now it's more about what their behavior is like, right? So behavioral studies, oh, I'll just skip that. Okay, so two large studies were done. Right, uh, by Ohio State University, Stockdale and Coons, and the University of Michigan. Right, um, In Ohio, they identified more than 100 behaviors of leaders and condensed all these behaviors into two large categories. In the University of Michigan, they did a similar set of studies looking at behaviors of leaders, and they also came up with two main categories. So that's pretty interesting. Two separate studies, but they came up with two categories in the end. On the Ohio side, um, they came up with the first category called initiating structure. This has to do with leaders who are good at allocating tasks and groups, defining goals and setting deadlines and standards for groups to adhere to. Right? So leaders have uh, this element of initiating structure. Leaders also show consideration, which is concern for the feelings of their workers, building rapport, which is a relationship with the workers, trust, respect, listening to their, to their followers and boosting self-confidence. Right? So you can see the initiating structure as well as the consideration. All right, what about on the University of Michigan side, we've got task-oriented behaviors. This is leaders, uh, these are leaders who focus on the task, what needs to be done, targets, standards, as well as supervising and monitoring workers. Quite similar to initiating structure, as well as relationship-oriented behaviors, which is focusing on the well-being of workers, understanding interpersonal relationships, right? As when leaders understand the relationships that they have with their workers, that, that, that relationship that they share, that's a relationship-oriented behavior, right? between workers and managers, right? When managers take care of their, their, their staff, you know, their staff definitely enjoy working for them, right? So as you can see, whether it's focusing on the task or whether it's focusing on the relationship, these are the two broad categories for leaders in terms of behavior. Which kind of leader would you prefer to work under? Someone focused on the task or someone focused on the relationship? What do you think? Personally, I don't mind a leader who knows uh, how to mix both, right? Because it's important to focus on the task at some points in time and you know if I'm struggling with something I want to know that my leader is going to you know, reach out to me through that relationship okay let's talk about adaptive leadership now this is a bit more modern so adaptive leadership is more modern because it deals with more complex and larger organization right in that sense traditional leadership usually fails right traditional leadership is for you know old-fashioned you know old-fashioned kind of notion where Everybody just works and just follows whatever the leader says. Leader says this, you just follow blindly without question. That's a traditional style. Uh, uh, adaptive style is, is better suited for complex and larger organizations, right? Where there's a need to change and adapt, right? Um, in the past, norms and values that were relevant in the past may now be irrelevant, right? For example, things like the leader is always right or the manager is always right. He's never wrong that might now become more and more irrelevant as we become more complex in our society and our organizations rather, right? Sometimes an organization needs to confront the need for change. If someone's not doing something right and you need to confront them, even if they're the leader, things need to change, right? A good example would be, let's say, for example, you know the phone company Nokia? Nokia used to be one of the biggest phone companies on earth and they completely lost their market share. Because other companies like Samsung, Xiaomi, Apple, they came up with better and better phones and they just got, you know, lost in the past. And they did not confront themselves for the need to change and, and adapt and modernize, right? Adaptive leadership uh, by Heifetz et al., the study, uh, where they looked at adaptive leadership is basically the art of mobilizing people to tackle tough issues, adapt and thrive, right? So leadership uh, is all about change. Right? Previously, uh, sorry, excuse me, let me rephrase that. Leadership, the style of leadership now has changed because previously leaders were the ones who provided solutions, right? 
sir, there's a problem, help me, ma'am, there's a problem, help me, and the leader provides a solution. But now, the entire workforce becomes responsible. Let's all think of a solution together, right? It can be a bit stressful for people because now everybody has to take on new roles, new skills, learn new values, right? Um, employees are often used to just having management solve their problems. If there's an issue, management will solve it, I'll just follow along, right? Adaptive leaders, however, cannot protect their workers. So they see the need for change, right? An adaptive leader involves everybody and says, you know, this is a problem. Let's all get together and try and solve it as a, as a team. Right? It's less about, uh, uh, less about norms, more about challenges, right? New challenges and also the need to survive, right? As more and more challenges, every day there's a new challenge, right? Like take, take the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, a huge challenge for leaders, right? It's difficult, right? And everybody has to find their way to adapt. And, and solve their problems and find some way to survive in this difficult world. And only an adaptive leader would excel at that, you know, finding out how to adapt and survive. Traditional is all about authority and giving it directions. Adaptive is about helping others find their inner authority. Traditional leadership is about maintaining norms and traditions. Adaptive leadership is about challenging norms and tradition and finding new ways to do things. Traditional leadership is about using skills and competencies available. And adaptive leadership is about pushing boundaries and extending people's skill and competencies. Traditional leadership is about tried and tested solutions and prior experience. Adaptive leadership is about finding new solutions, new directions that may be untested. Traditional leadership is, about, is, is useful in times of certainty, right, when things are going our way. But adaptive leadership is useful in times of uncertainty, like a global pandemic. You need to learn how to adapt, right? There are six principles um, that make up an adaptive leader, right? Firstly, is being able to look at the big picture, viewing the organization as a whole from above. Rather than getting caught up on the small little details of this and that, you need to look at the bigger picture. How does everything come together? Secondly, is about identifying, right? Determining the nature and extent of changes required for everybody, right? So if let's say, for example, we're going through a global pandemic, it's COVID-19, there are a lot of restrictions, what, what needs to be changed? we need to identify, right? An adaptive leader needs to know what needs to be changed and how much we need to change. Thirdly is regulate. Regulate what? Regulate distress, right? Motivate people, but don't overwhelm them. Come on, guys, we can do it. Let's do it together. Let's all help each other out. That's important, right? We need to reduce people's stress and motivate them to do better, right? Discipline, confronting issues directly, being open to differences. If your followers have a different opinion, are you going to shut them down or are you going to allow them to speak? At the same time, if they do something that's wrong, are you going to call them out for it, right? If there's something that they're doing that's illegal, call them out for it, confront them, fire them if you need to. Empowering people, right? To stop telling, but let people do what they know best with the knowledge they have. So I often see this in the media industry, when you, you get companies which hire uh, agencies to do adver advertisements for them, right? So let's say I'm a big company and I hire someone to do a video for me. But instead of letting that video guy do the video, I start telling him exactly what to do, right? I'm doing his job for him. And that shouldn't be the case, right? An adaptive leader allows their followers to use whatever skills they already have rather than to lecture them on what to do. Lastly is to protect people, to give people a voice, all people a voice, right? If someone feels the need to speak up, they have a voice. If someone's feeling, you know, um, um, affected in any way, you know, they, let's say they've got mental health issues, let's say they're a minority, they're feeling oppressed, you need to protect them, make sure that they all have a voice. Uh, now we move on to the three lols. Right? These are levels of leadership, LOL, right? if that helps you remember. right? So this is uh, proposed by James Scowler, the three levels of leadership, right? is the 3P model. right? Personal, and then private, and then public. right? These are the three levels. The inner level is personal and private, and the outer level goes from private to public. Notice the direction of the arrows move from inside to outside, right? from the personal to the public. All right, so let me explain this theory a little bit more. These are the three LOLs, Levels of Leadership, by James Scholar. Public is about influencing groups, right? It's kind of like public speaking, right? You're in front of a stage, in front of your entire staff, you're influencing large groups of people. Private is you're influencing individuals, a small number of people or just one or two people in your private group. For example, let's say you're you know, the boss of a company. The private, your public group will be all your staff and your private group would just be maybe five of your closest managers, right? Or your top managers. Personal would be yourself, skills, beliefs, emotions, and what's most important is your presence as a human being, right? As a leader, rather, right? Leaders, you know, great leaders, when they walk into a room, you feel their presence. 
you feel that this person really believes what they're talking about, that they have their emotions in check, that they really have the skills to deliver what they claim. Right? At its heart is the leader's self-awareness, his progress towards self-mastery and technical competence, and his sense of connection with those around him. It's the inner core, the source of a leader's outer leadership effectiveness. So this was a quote by Scowler, 2011, where he, he believed that it's truly the inner core of the leader that leads out into the outer, right? So if you've got your inner core strong, it will push out, it spills over into the outer areas, right? So a good example to remember is a droplet of water, right? When it drops onto a bowl or plate of water, right? Notice how the ripples form. The ripples start from the middle, where it's the strongest, and then it moves out in waves, right? That's how the personal moves out to the private and moves out to the public. Right. Okay, so let's evaluate some of the things we looked at. Nature versus nurture. Are leaders born or made? What do you think? We've looked at some theories of leadership, right? Now, some the great person theory or the great man theory, as it was previously called, believes in na nature, right? Explaining leadership. Why? Because it believes that leaders are born. Their their personality, right? What they're born with, their natural characteristics, that determines leadership, right? But Scowler, for example, as we just saw, is about developing your inner core. Of leadership that can be developed it can be worked on you can develop skills for it right so he believes that in uh, you know leadership is probably something that you can be made to be a leader right what about the theories you looked at are we are they individual are they situational right some leaders have more skills than others they may be more developed than others individually but situationally leaders need to adapt to different situations we saw adaptive leadership versus traditional leadership right if the situation is different traditional leaders tend to fail right adaptive leaders can adapt to the situation that brings out the best in them, right? What about application? How can we apply our theories that we've looked at to people, right? If you have a theory like James Scowler's theory and we have a leader who's not performing so well, perhaps we could advise them that, hey, instead of trying to perform well for others, why don't you focus on yourself first? Develop your own competencies before you try to help others become competent. The large studies by the University of Ohio and the University of Michigan, right? What do they indicate, right? Large studies are good because the more people that you sample, the more studies that you do, the larger the size, right? It increases your generalizability, right? Right, let's move on. Okay, part B is leadership style. So, um, the first one is called feedler, feed, feedless, feed, fightless, feedless, I believe it's pronounced feedless contingency theory. So, it looks a bit complicated. Um, you can take a screenshot of this and come back to it later. Uh, I will be discussing what, what each of those elements means. So you can see one element here is low LPC. LPC stands for least preferred co-worker and high LPC. And basically, uh, if, if these three factors are high, 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 this is what we expect to see. If it's low, 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 this is what we expect to see. High LPC uh, is here and low LPC. Okay, it looks a bit confusing, but don't worry. I'll break it down um, as we go along from slide to slide. Okay, but you can come back to this later. Okay, we're going to look at leadership effectiveness, right? What are some theories of leadership effectiveness? So Fiedler in 1967 believed that leadership was the interaction between the style of leadership that a person has and the situation, right? So it's not just about the leader, it's the style of the leader and the situation. Different styles are applicable to different situations, right? Like we saw for traditional and adaptive leaders, in times of uncertainty, Adaptive leaders do better. In times of certainty, traditional leaders do better, right? Uh, what are the factors that go into this? So there are several factors. First is the task and relationship orientation, right? Using the LPC, which we'll look at in a moment, right? Next is the leader-member relationship, right? Thirdly is the task structure, right? For example, um, if, uh, how should I phrase this? A task structure would be, for example, if you give someone a lot of instructions, very clear on what to do, that's high task structure. If you just tell the person, okay, figure it out on your own, that's low task structure, right? Lastly is position power. So position power is like the difference in status, right? A CEO has a higher level of position power, right? They might conduct themselves in a way that they don't really talk to the lower level staff. So that plays a role as well. Different types of leaders fit better into different types of organization, right? What kind of leader do you think fits for a school organization? What type of, what type of leader should fit in a prison organization? 
What about a hospital? Right? In a school, you probably need a leader, especially if it's with a primary school, young children. You probably need a principal or a leader who's fun and can work well with kids. In a prison environment, you probably need someone who's a lot more stricter, has higher authority, more power. In a hospital, you probably need a leader who's empathetic, able to you know, handle difficult cases, and, you know, talk to people who are sick and struggling. So LPC, this is LPC. LPC, LPC stands for Least Preferred Coworker. Right? So well, the question is basically, if you had to rank in your entire organization, you know, let's say you're working in a company, the question would be, who is the least preferred co-worker? Think of the least preferred co-worker in your company and then rank that person mentally from unfriendly to friendly, unpleasant to pleasant, rejecting to accepting and so on and so forth. So least preferred co-worker is someone you don't like working with in general, right? And you know, everybody has someone they don't like working with, right? That's, I mean, it, it would be very unusual if you said that, oh, I can work with absolutely every single person on the planet. No, there are some people who just annoy us, right? So the scale isn't so much about measuring, uh, so isn't so much about the co-worker, but rather about the person who views them, right? So it's how you view that person, right? Now, if you have a low LPC, uh, sorry, it's a 16-item questionnaire, and it assumes that everybody's LPC is generally speaking unpleasant. Of course, this is a person that you don't really like working with, right? Uh, a low LPC person is usually suited for task-oriented behaviors, right? Um, and if you score them a little bit on the higher side, they are a little bit better suited for relationship-oriented uh, purposes, right? So for example, low LPC means you really don't like this unpleasant person in your office, right? And if you really rank them on the very low side, it, it means that, yes, you may not like them, so the best thing to do is to work with them in a task-oriented manner. That means just let's, get, let, let's just get the job done, right? If you have someone you don't like, let's just get the job done. If you have high LPC ratings, you, you, yes, you don't really love them, but you don't mind working with them, so then you can move on towards slightly more relationship-oriented tasks, right? Whereas if you really don't like someone, just focus on the task and get it done. Okay? So this is another image of the feedless contingency model. You can see here, let's look at the top part. Okay? Let's break down this uh, uh, picture. So on the top here, it says leader-member relations. Right? Good, 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 good. Boom, 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 boom. So leader-member relations. Let's say you and your leader, do you have a good relationship? Let's assume that you have a good relationship. So good. Task structure. Let's say your leader gives you very clear instructions, tells you exactly what needs to be done. So it's high task structure. Let's say position power. Position power. That means your leader has a very uh, high position over you and there's a clear power difference between both of you. So it's strong. Right? Favorableness of the situation is most favorable for which appropriate behavior task-oriented leaders. Meaning that if all of this is good, Right? You would want a leader who is focused on the task. Right? What about relationship oriented? Let's look at this. Let's say the member uh, uh what's the word for it? Yeah, okay. I mean basically the same thing. Ask yourself how's the relationship between the member and the leaders? Is it poor? Ask yourself how's the task structure? Is it high? Is it low? Right? Is there a lot of structure? Is there less structure? Ask yourself about the position of power. Is there a difference in the power? Is it weak? Is it strong? Right, between the leader and you, uh, favorableness of the situation, how favorable is it? Most favorable, task-oriented, moderate favorable, relationship-oriented, most favorable will be a task-oriented leader, appropriate leader behavior. So these are the times when a task-oriented leader does well, these are the situations when a task-oriented leader does well, and these are the situations where a relationship-oriented leader uh, you know, does better than a task-oriented leader Right, under those situations. Okay. So for example, let me give you a case study. This can be a bit confusing, so it's always better to have a case study. This is my personal case study. When I was, uh, my first job, my first office job was working in my church. I worked as a social media and communications executive, right? Everybody in my team was likable, and I had a very good, I felt a very good team spirit within my team. My job role was to do it printing, preparing slides, replying emails, updating the app. I had a junior role. I reported to my head of department, and sometimes I would also lead uh, smaller groups. Okay. I cannot impose rules on people without higher approval, right? So I didn't have great power, I had some power. 
based on what you know about my personality, was I good? Was I a good fit for this job? Right. So you can see first and foremost, leader member relationships was good in my case. So it's going to be one of these four. Right. Good. Next was task structure. What does the task structure look like? It looks pretty structured. Right. Pretty high task structure. So somewhere here, I had a junior role. I cannot impose rules on others. So I had weak. Right. I was weak. So what you know was I good fit for this job. Uh, most favorable situation would be have a task-oriented leader behavior. And yes, I did. I had you know, a leader who provided my task, gave me my job description, and I knew what, what I needed to do. Right. So I had a pretty good fit for that job. Now let's look at the situational theory of leadership. Right. So the situational theory is like this. Right. It's got the S1 to S4 and D1 to D4. The S1 to S4 has to do with the leaders, and I believe the D1 to D4, if I'm not mistaken, is to do with the followers. So let's talk about the leaders first. S1 is directing, leaders who just give direction. High directive, low support. S2 is to do with coaching, so high direction and high support behaviors. S3 is a leader who gives you a lot of support, high support by low direction. They just support you a lot. They don't really tell you what to do. Uh, delegating is the final one. Delegating is where you don't have much direction, you don't have much support. They just say, okay, just handle it, just do it, right? So supportive behavior is on this side. Is it high? Is it low? Directive behavior, is it high? Is it low? Directive basically means does your leader tell you exactly what needs to be done? Supportive behavior, is it, do they give you the support and help you figure out what needs to be done, right? So based on these four quadrants, what kind of leadership style is being shown by the leader? At the same time, we also have for the followers. So let's look at the followers. Followers can be either D1, D2, D3, or D4, right? So it corresponds by color. Right, D1 kind of followers are people who have low competence. Can you see the word there? Low competence. People are not very skilled and um, they need a high level of commitment. And so because of that, because they're not very skilled, what needs to be done is the leader needs to give them more direction. D2, they have some competence but not so much, uh, less, and less, uh, less commitment. So you can just do coaching. You don't have to give them too much direction, just a little bit. Moderate to high competence, you can go to S3, supporting. And those who are already very competent, let's say you have a follower who knows more than you, you don't really need to tell them what to do. You can just delegate. Okay, you handle the website. You do this. You print that. Right? You can just delegate. So my, my, my leaders in my office job when I had one used to first have to teach me and coach me because it was my first time doing the job. And then later on, once I got the hang of it, they could just delegate. Say, Ross, just print these brochures. And I immediately know what to do. Right? So it can change. All right. So the situational theory of leadership was proposed by Hersey and Blanca. Right? There is no single effective leadership style. Right? Leaders have their own preferred style, but it may not be appropriate all the time. Some leaders want to be more democratic. Some leaders want to be more autocratic. There is no perfect leadership style. It really depends on the situation. Right? It's most effective if you can adapt your style to the situation at hand. Okay? So there are two main concepts in situational theory of leadership. Firstly, leadership style. What kind of leadership style does the person have? Secondly is the maturity level. Right? So this has to do with the leader. Leadership style is all about the leader. What kind of leader are they? Democratic, autocratic, directive, permissive, that kind of leader. Or what about the maturity level? You also have to consider the level of the individual followers, right? Your entire group of followers under you. What's the level of maturity? Here the word maturity means the capacity to set high attainable goals, the willingness of your followers to take responsibility, and whether or not they have the relevant education or experience for the task at hand. That's maturity level, right? If you're leading a group of people who are completely new and don't know what to do, you have to take a lot more effort to direct them. But if you're leading a team of experts who already know what they need to do, then you can take a bit of a backseat and delegate, right? Okay, so leadership styles are in uh, four levels. Got a bit of a fancy animation here. Firstly, is directive behavior, where the leader can defines roles and explains exactly the how, why, when, and where. Okay? Right. So that is called telling. Right? We call this a telling behavior. Right? I tell you what to do. One, two, three, A, B, C. Secondly, for example, still directive but more of a two-way communication. Right? There's more relationship skills involved. This is known as selling. Right? So I do give you some direction but I allow for a little bit more of a two-way communication. Right? If members buy into the process, they feel like they're part of the team. Leaders need to sell it to them. The third one is having less direction and shared decision making, right? So everybody, let's get together, let's figure this out. It's called participating, right? Leaders who show participating behaviors. Right? And lastly, monitor, 
don't just direct, just monitor, delegate responsibly to the group. Right? So this is called delegating. Right? I give you the responsibility, you handle it. Okay? The maturity levels leads uh, is more about the followers, right? What's their maturity level? M1 stands for lacking skills in the job that's needed or being very unwilling to take responsibility. M2 is a better kind of follower, people who are enthusiastic, but they need a bit of training before they can actually perform. Right? M3 is even better, experienced followers, but sometimes they lack a bit of confidence in themselves. They know what to do, but they lack confidence or perhaps they're just not willing to take up the task. And lastly, people who are experienced and incredibly responsible right? and willing to do the task. Okay? So maturity here is more about the task specific. Like for example, a person can be very skilled and confident, but unwilling when it comes to doing a task that they're unfamiliar with. There's a difference here between the ability. So the two factors are basically one, whether or not the follower has the ability to do the task. So they could either be lacking those skills or perhaps they're very experienced in their ability to do a task. Or, or, or the second one is whether or not they're willing to take responsibility to do a task. Right? So you have to have both. Right? The follower needs to know what they need to do. At the same time, they also need to be willing to do it. Okay? It's usually task specific. Okay, so I uh, don't know why I repeated this picture again. Okay. So, what tasks are your M1 and M4? What are the kinds of tasks that you find you're both lacking in skill and unwilling? Or, what are the tasks in your life that you do that you're very experienced and you're very willing? Right. So, for example, for me, I love teaching. I have the skill to teach and I enjoy doing it. I take responsibility to do it. So, I'm M4 for that kind of a task. My M1 task would be something like learning how to code. I'm trying to learn how to code on my own. I really don't like doing it. I really don't have the skills for it. So I'm an M1 when it comes to coding. Let's look at leadership styles. So style of leader, leader behavior. Previous research problems were this, right? So in previous research, a lot of research tends to believe or lean towards the fact that democratic styles of leadership are the more superior styles. That's not necessarily true, right? We, we tend to stereotype democracy as the best type of leadership model, right? And the reason for this is because people in the past did not distinguish between participation and direction. Let me explain. So a participative leader is one that involves everybody, kind of like a democratic leader. Okay, we've got a problem, let's all sit down together, everybody share your opinion, okay? I want all of you to participate. And, uh, and that's not the same as direction. Direction is when you tell people you do this, you do this, you do this. And in the past, people believe that you can only be one or the other. But actually, leaders can be both. Right? There is a distinguishing uh, quality between both. That if you're participative, you can also be directive. If you're directive, you can also be participative. It's not just one or the other. Right? Sometimes people believe that participation is the opposite of direction. And that's not necessarily true. Sometimes they can go hand in hand together. Right? People used to think that directive leadership is anti-democratic. If the leader just tells me what to do, that's anti-democracy and that's bad. But that's not true, right? People used to believe that decision making is equivalent to decision execution. And that's not true, right? Let me give you an example. Let's say everybody's go let's say the company is going through the COVID-19 pandemic and they need to make some tough decisions, right? So they get, the leader says, okay, everybody, let's come together in the boardroom, let's have a meeting, let's all decide what we need to do. So that's the decision-making process, right? But decision execution is different. Decision execution is like, okay, after we've discussed everything, step one, step two, step three, what needs to be done? Okay, you do step one, you do step two, you do step three, that's the direction coming in, right? So a, a good leader should actually have a mixture of both. Right? But past research often likes to overemphasize the qualities of a democratic leader and think that that's the best. That's not necessarily true. Okay? For example, let's take, uh, let's take another example. In my country, Malaysia, COVID-19 infections almost hit about 10,000 per day. That was quite scary, right? A few months ago. And, if that hap and when that happened, fast decisions needed to be made. Right? 10,000 new, new cases of COVID-19 infections per day. We need to decide what to do quickly. What kind of leader is more effective here? A democratic leader or a directive leader? What do you think? In my opinion, a directive leader. Because if you use the democratic style, you have to call 50 different departments of people to come together and discuss and find a solution. That would take forever, right? You need to be more directive. Okay, quickly, let's close down the airports, let's close this, let's close that, and so on and so forth. Okay? 
leadership styles, uh, style of user behavior. So this is by Mukzik and Reinman. Democratic leadership is not always effective, right? Leadership is a two-way street, right? It's not just making decisions. It's also involving people in the decision-making process, right? However, that being said, democracy only works if followers are willing and able to participate, right? You can't have a democratic, a democratic style of leadership if your followers have no idea what to do. If your followers don't know what to do, you need to tell them what to do, have directive. If they're not, leader must be directive and do a lot of follow-up, right? Direction is not inconsistent with participation. Participation, direction, okay? Two big things. You can either have low participation or high participation. You can also have low direction or high direction. Okay, and I'm going to put that in a table. If you have low participation, usually that's an autocratic leader, one who just doesn't really get involved with the group. High participation leaders are democratic. There are leaders which give low direction are usually permissive. They're like, okay, you just do whatever you want. Leaders who give high direction, direction are directive. And so we can divide this into four quadrants. So let's look at quadrant number one. A directive autocrat. What does that mean? First of all, they're directive. Means they give a lot of direction. They're also an autocrat. Means that they don't really participate in decision making. They make all the decisions. So in this one, it's unilateral decision. Unilateral means one way, meaning the leader is the only one who makes it. Closely supervises the followers. Quick decisions. And it's, it's, it's good. Let me rephrase that. It's good for making quick decisions or supervising new staff. Right? You, you make the decisions for them. Tell them what to do. The second one is permissive autocrat. So permissive, as we know, you can see that it's on direction, it's low. So this, this leader is very permissive, gives a lot of permission, yeah, yeah, just do what you want. But is also an autocrat, so doesn't get involved in decision making. So this person makes decisions on their own, but allows the staff to decide how to implement them, right? It's good for simple tasks and also when dealing with skilled staff. So for example, a uh, leader may make the decision, okay, we need to make sure that each table only has a maximum of two people eating dinner and not more than that, right? Okay, you decide how you want to do it. So maybe the staff want to, you know, put an X marks the spot, you know, on, on a chair or something or remove the extra chairs and extra tables. So they let the staff decide, but the leader makes the ultimate decision of what's going to happen. Staff just implement it. Next one is directive democrat. So directive means they give a lot of the direction, they tell people what to do, but they're also democrat, meaning that they allow people to get involved in the process. So they invite full participation, but they also monitor closely. This is good for complex decisions that need direction. Right? You want to get everybody involved, everybody give your input, it's a difficult decision to make, okay, I think this is what needs to be done. Right? Lastly is the permissive democrat. So permissive means they don't get, uh, they allow people to do what they want. And Democrat means everybody's involved. So this is the ideal leader for American society, right? Generally speaking, where there's high participation in decision making, but they also allow a lot of autonomy, right? So when I worked in America, um, this wasn't really the case. I, I've, I've worked in America as like a cashier. I worked in food service in Colorado. And although, yes, I did have some autonomy, I did also have to follow a lot of rules, right? Depending on whatever my manager asked me to do. So yes, uh, but I can see why Americans might uh, idolize this kind of leadership because they get the freedom to do what they want and they also participate in a lot of democratic-based decision-making, okay? So let's evaluate individual versus situational. So uh, according to Fiedler, leaders have individual styles which are effective in different situations, right? So they focused on how to match the situation to the individual leaders, right? Percy and Blancard talked very much about fitting style to situation, right? So you're only effective if you know how to fit your individual style to the situation, right? The importance of fit, right? The difference with uh, fit between basically the leader and the situation, right? So uh, appl application would be like, for example, if you're advising a company, company is having a difficult time fitting the leader to the situation. So first you need to understand where the leader is coming from, what kind of leader leadership style do they have? Secondly, you need to ask, well, is the task very highly structured? How's the relationship between the leaders and the workers, you know, um, and stuff like that. And then from there, you can use Fiedler's model to see, okay, this leader would perform best in this situation, or let's change the leader, this leader will perform better, right? The difference between participating, making decisions, and direction, implementing decisions, right? So the application here would be understanding that democracy is not always the best form of leadership, right? You need to have a mixture, or know when to use democracy or autocracy. The psychometrics of the LPC scale, you can find this online, right? Um, go and read up online about the least preferred co-worker scale. 
Well, firstly, I mean, off the top, you know, it's a numerical base scale, so it's quantitative, which is good, right? Because it's easy to administer, easy to analyze. So some of the things you can talk about. However, at the same time, it is a self-report, so it's prone to social desirability, right? People can answer whatever they want. It's also rather limited because it's just a string of numbers, so you can't really explain yourself in depth. You might not be able to capture as much meaning. Okay. Let's move on to leaders and followers. Leaders and followers, um, one of the theories is the leader member exchange model by Dan Seru. Okay. Originally, this was called the vertical dyad uh, linkage theory. Now, this talks about the relationship between the leader, manager, and the followers. It comes in three stages. Stage number one, role taking. Let's say you've just joined the group and the leader now needs to assess your skills and set expectations. Hey everybody, welcome. This is your first day at the job. Okay, let me understand your background, understand what you can do and so on and so forth. Stage two is role making. Role making is where the followers begin to work, prove their skills and the leader observes and classifies the followers. Either into in-group followers, which is a close inner circle with the leader, often more loyal and trusted. Or are they out-group followers where they're not so close with the leader and oftentimes um, these people are less motivated or they're less competent, which is why they're in the out-group. So, I mean, in a company, you'll get people who perform better than others. And those who perform better are usually within the inner circle. Those who don't perform as well are usually the outer circle. Stage three is known as role routinization. This is where routines for work have already been well established. Right? The in-group gets more attention from the leader, more growth, more challenges and more opportunities to do more. Right? Whereas the out-group gets less access to the leader. They have less growth, less opportunities, and they don't really get challenged to grow, unfortunately. Can you think of one criticism of the leadership exchange model we just looked at in the previous slide? Personally, I think it's unfair to discriminate between followers and deny opportunities to some. I mean, if the follower is in the art group and you constantly deny them the opportunity to grow, how are they ever going to become better? Right? Also, at the same time, the leadership exchange model only looks at things from the leader's point of view rather than looking at things also from the follower's perspective, right? They tend to favor the leader's perspective rather than the follower. Right? Now, can out-group members move into the in-group? Yes, they can, right? According to er er Erdogan et al. in 2015, they stated that uh, the out-group can try communicating well with the in-group, like, hey, can we be friends? Okay, can you teach me this? Can you teach me that? Let me become better, right? So they may, achieve, may, may be able to achieve a move from out-group to in-group. Right? by communicating well, establishing good relationships, and so on. Okay. Let's look at another model, the Individualized Leadership Model by Dan Saru. This is an extension of the previous theory, where the followers are considered to be independent, and the leaders are considered to be weak. And it focuses on the one-to-one -one relationship between a superior and a subordinate. So they use a different terminology here. Superiors are understood as giving investment and expecting a return from the subordinate. Subordinates uh, invest their time and expect a return from the supervisor. Right. Um, let me highlight this part in, uh, in the study itself, where it says, first, they view their superior's behavior, hit nods, praise, attention, and interactions, as providing them with support for feeling of self -worth, feelings of self-worth, for which the subordinates in turn provide a satisfying performance. So based on this sentence, can you see how there is a relationship right first and foremost the superior's behavior giving praise for example provides support feelings of self-worth and then the subordinates in turn provide a satisfying performance but by providing a satisfying performance you get more praise and then more praise gives you better self-worth and then you give a better performance and so this is uh, easily represented by a circular diagram which i'll show you in a moment right second to maintain the satisfying performance received a superior provides additional support for self-worth thereby becoming a leader. This completes a cyclical process that begins with the subordinate's perception of self-worth provided by the superiors and ends with the superior providing support for self-worth. So this is basically what it looks like. The relationship between superior and subordinate. The superior provides support, the subordinate provides a good performance, right? And the circle goes on and on and on, right? You do a good job, well done, great job. Oh, he made me feel so good. I'm even gonna do a better job next time. Wow, well done, even better job. And the cycle continues. Okay. Now ask yourself, are you more of a leader or are you a follower? Which one are you? Okay. I love this quote by Kelly. It says, studying followership has helped us, uh, helps us understand leadership, right? which, I, which I believe is very true. So now let's talk about followership. The way an individual follower follows a leader. This can be reciprocal, right? two-way. 
um, success is not just the leader but also the followers, right? So if you want an organization to be successful, it's a reciprocal relationship. It's not just the leader who is successful, it's also the followers who have to be successful and both have to be working well together, right? Kelly in 1998 uh, highlighted the qualities of effective followers. Kelly highlighted four, right? Uh, types of followers, five different qualities. Critical, not critical, active or passive. Oh, I think it's four factors, but she came up with five different quadrants. Anyway, we will look at this in the next following slides and we'll make more sense then. Okay, so let's look at four qualities first off. The four qualities of an effective follower. Firstly, what's the quality? Self-management, right? These are followers who think critically, control their actions well and work independently. Okay, I need you to do this, this, this. And the leader can entrust them that they're going to manage themselves, manage their time, get the job done, right? The second one is commitment, right? These are followers who are committed to the vision of the organization. They're very committed to the goal and they keep the morale high, right? They have positive feeling in the organization, very committed. And they know that if you set them a goal, that they will definitely achieve it. Next is the competency. Competency is having the skills which are necessary, right? Higher than average skills, in fact, are even better. And also lead, uh, followers who upskill themselves, who train themselves, who become better at what they do. Lastly is courage. Now courage talks about holding true to your beliefs, having high ethical standards, followers who don't try to cheat, right? And they're loyal, honest and candid. They're open with their leaders and they tell them the truth, right? They're also loyal and honest. Okay. Now there are also five types of followers. These are types of followers, right? Previously it was qualities of followers, now it's types. The first one is the sheep. What is a sheep to you, right? A sheep is someone who's passive, lacks commitment, needs a lot of supervision, right? This is a, possibly the worst kind of follower to have, right? Unless you are a very controlling leader, you don't want to have a sheep, right? Secondly is the yes people, equally bad, right? There are people who are committed, but they tend to be very conformist, right? They don't question leadership, which is not a good thing, right? In an organization, sometimes people need to question and confront their leaders because leaders are not perfect, they make mistakes. But this person's like, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, I'll just do it, I'll just do it, I'll just do it, right? That's not always a good thing. The third one is a pragmatic. Pragmatic is someone who's not a trailblazer. They tend to follow the majority. They're kind of like followers who are in the background. They're just in the background, they just follow along, right? They want to be, pragmatic also means practical, right? They just want to get the job done. I'll just follow the majority and I just do it, right? The next one is alienated. Alienated leaders, are alienated, sorry, alienated followers are people who are very negative. They constantly question, why this, why that, why this, why that, why doing that, why not this, right? It can be very annoying, right? They're overly critical, very critical of leaders, saying everything they do is wrong, right? Lastly is the star follower, the best one, right? People, uh, followers who are positive, active, they, they, they don't just follow blindly, they question when they need to, and they're also independent, they can get the job done on their own, right? What kind of follower are you? A sheep people? Are you a yes person? Are you a star follower? Are you feeling alienated? Right, so how do we measure leadership? We use the Leadership Practices Inventory, LPI. This was developed by Kuzes and Posner, I believe. Uh, leadership, they believe, is measurable, learnable, and teachable. Right? It's just a collection of behaviors that you can measure and you can teach people to do. So they developed the LPI to measure five different practices of leadership. Right? They established this research on by looking at successful leaders. Right? The LPI is an individual self-rating and also contains observer ratings. Right? So not just you, but people who have observed you. A profile is not just a picture that you're stuck with. What does that mean? That means after you've done the LPI test, that doesn't mean that that's who you are for the rest of time, right? Personality tests are the same. Sometimes people's personality change and shift over time, right? So nothing is set in stone. In fact, you can use this kind of a test to help identify areas for personal development. So if you can see from the LPI that you're weak in one area, you can develop that area. It doesn't mean you're going to be weak forever, right? Different ways for different people um, to help them develop into leaders, right? So first one is modeling the way, right? Uh, one of the best practices of being a leader is to be a good role model, right? Setting a good personal example, having a clear philosophy in what to do, right? Second one is inspiring, right? Leaders who inspire a shared vision, right? They describe the future, they make it exciting, right? We're gonna achieve $1 million in sales by the end of this year, right? They share a vision that's strong. Thirdly is challenging the process, right? Taking risks, new challenges, Right? Okay, guys, we're going to do something we've never done before, right? Thirdly, a good practice of a leader is enabling others to act, right? Treating people with dignity and respect. I believe that you can do this, 
right? Supporting your decisions of your followers. Yes, good decision. Yes, I believe you, right? And lastly is encouraging the heart, right? Praising people. It's good when people do a good job, give them praise that they deserve. Acknowledging their skills. Wow, you're really clever. Wow, you've got great artwork, right? It, it, it encourages people's heart. So these are the five practices of leadership which are measured by the LPI, right? So for example, model way, right? Sets a personal example of what is expected. Makes certain that people adhere to agreed on standards. Follows through on promises and commitments. Asks for feedback on how her actions affect people's performance. Builds consensus around organization's values. It's clear about her philosophy of leadership, right? So this is some of the uh, sentences or items that come under model the way. There's also inspiring a shared vision, right? Talking about the future, trends influencing our work, describing a compelling image of the future. So challenging the process. Seeks challenging opportunities to test skills. Challenges people to try new approaches. And then basically you read this and you break yourself. Do you challenge people? Do you develop cooperative relationships and so on? Right? And you rate yourself and then you ask your followers to rate you as well. People who have observed you leading, do they agree with your ratings as well? Okay? You can find out more about this online. Find the scale for yourself and make sure you memorize a few of the examples. Okay? So at the end of all that, what do you think? Are leaders born or made? Based on uh, what we saw earlier, the whole uh, five practices of best leadership. I think based on Kuzas and Postler, leaders are probably made. Right? These are the five areas that you can develop over time. So a quick evaluation. Okay, nature or nurture? Are leaders born or made? What do you think? Okay. Individual versus situational, right? Leaders versus followers, right? What is the style of an individual leader? What about the followers? Do they change the situation? If you have followers who you know, are strong, are skilled, the leadership style has to adapt. If you have followers who don't know what to do, the leadership style needs to change, right? So the situation that the leader is in can affect their behavior, right? At the same time, a leadership style is personal to that individual leader. What about applications, right? You can use the LPI to measure leadership practices. You can identify areas that people are weak. You can also help them improve. Not only that, the LPI is quite valid because it not only takes a personal account, it also takes into the ratings of observers, which is great. I think I just added one more sentence, which is understanding leadership something. Is it? Understanding leaders and followers better. Yeah. So, anyway, that's the end. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening and watching. My name is Ross. Follow me on Instagram if you want to connect with me at Magic Ross Seven. Uh, please do help me by liking, commenting, subscribing, and feel free to share this channel with your friends. If you feel like donating, you're more than welcome to donate. You know, COVID nineteen has been tough for teachers like me. I currently don't have a job as I do this, um, you know, but I get by here and then. And I would like to say thank you to all the generous donors. Um, I've had a small handful of people who have supported me, and I really thank you guys very much. Um, that's it for now, and I'll catch you guys next time.